Hey, everybody, this is Richard Deitch, and welcome to the Sports Media Podcast. My producer is Patrick Antonetti. One guest this week, and it is a great one, WWE star Becky Lynch, one of the great uh, performers in professional wrestling history. Um, she has a massively uh, long resume since uh, joining the WWE in 2013, including being part of the first uh, women's main event in WrestleMania history. Um, Becky was great. We, we didn't really talk at all about storyline, but about just how she approaches social media. Uh, I think she's a pure genius when it comes to that. How she looks at uh, media opportunities, how she approaches media interviews. It's a, uh, it's a very media-centric uh, conversation about how one of the best performers in WWE history sort of approaches the stuff that's outside the ring. So even if you're not a wrestling fan, I think you're going to enjoy it because it's a media conversation. And uh, noting for the WWE, and I appreciate them getting Becky Lynch, uh, SummerSlam will be at Ford Field in Detroit uh, this Saturday. You can catch that live 8 p.m. on Peacock in the United States and the WWE Network everywhere else. All right. And with that, Becky Lynch coming up on the Sports Media Podcast. All right, you could do an hour on Becky Lynch's resume, but I will try to condense this as best as I can. She's one of the greatest performers in WWE history. Uh, in my opinion, a genius when it comes to social media to promote her brand and character. The best, actually, I've ever seen in WWE. Since joining that company in 2013, endless amounts of accomplishments, including being part of the first women's main event, in WrestleMania history, where she defeated Ronda Rousey and Charlotte Flair. She currently has a uh, very intense program with WWE Hall of Famer Trish Stratus. Uh, one quick PR note before we get to Becky. Ford Field in Detroit. It's a great stadium and setup, actually, for this. We'll be hosting the 36th Annual SummerSlam. You can catch that live 8 p.m. on Saturday on Peacock, United States. WWE Network everywhere else. And with that... The man has come to this mediocre, low-budget podcast. Welcome, Becky Lynch, to the Sports Media Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Made me feel like the goat. Yeah, the podcast is over, Becky. The po- the introduction was just too long, and we, we are done. Um, all right. My goal, uh, as I told you before we started, is to ask you some cues um, you normally do not get. And I'm really interested um, just how you approach and think about media. One of the things that WWE has done for a long time, and they've done very, very well, is they get their content in the quote-unquote mainstream press. So, for instance, I've seen you on the Today Show. You've done ESPN many times. I once watched you do a um, sports business journal conference with Stephanie McMahon. So how do you look at getting mainstream attention versus the traditional attention you would get in the wrestling press? Well, I, I think I think that's one of those things where when these opportunities are presented to you, well, first of all, you never say no. And uh, and, and, and there are things that um, that you want to do, you know, as as a as a as a as a performer and coming up like you want to you want to go into the mainstream. You want to bring in a, a bigger audience, but also bring your audience with you to other places because I remember watching as a fan and when you would see your favorite wrestlers on, on, on outside TV shows that are maybe more mainstream, like you loved it, you celebrated it. And, uh, and, and so I think it's, a, it's a matter of how do we, we constantly cultivate more of an audience? How do we bring our audience with us and how do we keep doing that in a way that feels authentic and that we can get people excited about wrestling because my thing is I want people to feel the way about wrestling the way I do I want people to be excited about it I want people to love it I want people to be passionate about it I want people to want to talk about it all the time I want people to get excited about it because that's how I felt as a fan and so um and and so when I think I think when these opportunities are presented to you it's 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 a no-brainer yes let Let's do it. And also, because I've been on the other end of the spectrum, I've been the one who wasn't getting any media opportunities that was scratching and clawing to get any part on TV. And so um, and having to do like backstage digital interviews to, 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 to try and garner 
some sort of an audience because I wasn't getting any TV time. And so, uh, and, and, and so when, when I'm given opportunities, I, I don't want to turn any of them down. How do you decide on which interviews you want to do? Or like you just said before, do you essentially have a blanket yes for everything? I mean, for the most part, uh, there, there, there's, there's a lot of yeses. The only thing is if it conflicts with my family, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's something where it's going to make life way harder for, for my family, my daughter, I can't do it because of commitments there or, or commitments to the TV show, to wrestling. Um, and, 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 and so as long as they make sense, but there, there's another um, part of it where a lot of the time I'm, I'm asking to, to do other media opportunities, for example, being to go back to Ireland and 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 garner that audience, and um and part of it is is my family back home, like because I can be on the Today Show and and things like that, but my mom isn't going to see it, you know, and so there's a little sense of of Irish pride of being able to be on on TV shows back home and and do all that and i feel very lucky that i've been able to do all of it really and and balance it pretty well let me ask you this how different are you depending on the media outlet i I would imagine if you're doing irish breakfast television you know dublin breakfast television you're going to be a certain way but when it comes to um like united states outlets like are you would you be a very different interview on the today show versus some, let's say, radio station promoting uh, Raw or SmackDown like in that town that night? Gosh, I don't know. I I think it depends on the energy that the the interviewer is bringing from you too. And also, like, what what are we there to promote? Am I there to promote myself? Am I there to promote a storyline? Am I there to promote that I want to decimate Trish Stratus? And so you're going to get, like, if if it's the latter, you're going to get a lot more violence from me. (laughs) But if it's like, explain to me what wrestling is then you're going to get maybe a softer side a very passionate side i mean i i am passionate passionate about decimating trish stratus too so um i think you'll always you'll always get a sense of passion but it it depends on uh maybe maybe the softness or the or the meanness or the the viciousness in in the delivery there, there's there been an immense amount of things written about you over the last decade plus. I'm not talking social media, Twitter, et cetera. I'm, I'm talking like sort of traditionally uh, pieces that have been written about you. Um, how much do you keep up with what is what is being said to you in the, like the mainstream press? You know, I try not to. I try not to keep stock of what anybody is saying about me. I, uh, I I try to avoid comments. I try to avoid dirt cheats because I think, look, I think of myself as an artist. I do think of myself as an artist. And I think um, when you are being bombarded by opinions, good or bad, good or bad, it takes an effect on you. And one way or the other, whether you're mentally strong enough to say well that doesn't bother me somewhere it lives it lives in your head and especially when it's the negative stuff it will live in your head but even the good stuff you know like what what brought you to the dance doesn't always keep you at the dance you know so so you have to be able to adapt and you have to be able to trust your instincts and go with that and i find that in this world where we are constantly being barred by opinions you should be this you should do that you should it it takes different thinking to be able to stand out and you have to be able to trust yourself because you're the one that followed your gut to get to where you want to get to. And so if you're listening to other people saying, well, I would have done this, I would have done that. Well, you didn't and you haven't lived the life that I've been in and you haven't spent the experience that I have spent in the ring and around the business. And so I think, I think there's a way of respecting other people's opinions but trying not to get too invested and involved because one way or another, whatever anybody says to you, it lives, it lives in your brain and, uh, and, and it'll affect, it'll affect something that you do, whether you like it or not, whether, whether Billy Joe 
Murphy is is saying that he didn't like your clothes, you, you know, and you're like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't wear those clothes. And maybe you're not even thinking, well, Billy Joe didn't like my clothes. And so I shouldn't wear those clothes. But some way you're going, oh, I don't maybe maybe I don't want to wear this. You just don't know how these things are going to affect you. And I like to kind of keep my mind as my mind. <laughs> you know, I don't want anybody else's mind in my mind. Makes sense. A lot of a lot of professional athletes actually have your uh um, have your philosophy when it comes to that. But by the way, Billy Joe Murphy, that sounds like a good Irish boy. I don't know if he would, he, I don't feel like he would be taking the shot at you. It'd be uh, no, like Jack, no, Smith, no. Jack Smith or someone else like that. B- Billy Joe Murphy probably loves me. But still, again, maybe Billy Joe Murphy is saying that I should be wearing those clothes. And then I look at myself on TV and I go, I shouldn't be wearing those clothes. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's layers to this thing. So there are. I, um, I asked this of Seth and he gave me a really fascinating answer. So I want to ask you the same question. Um, promotion is obviously a massive part of your business. And so how do you navigate interviews where some people want you in character and in storyline, like they want the Becky Lynch experience if they're talking to you, and then other interviewers where they want to talk about the business of wrestling or your professional career. How do you navigate that? I think it's walking a fine line, right? And there's, you know, people say it, that, that, that kayfabe is dead, and to a certain extent it is. But people want to believe it. That's the thing. People, people want to believe what we're doing. And I, I want to believe that everybody, you know, when, when we're invested in it, you, you want people to have that emotional hook. But there's also a thing where, where, where we tell them, well, this is a story. And, and it's actually being, being driven more and more that people are getting into, oh, well, this is the story, the storytelling, the storytelling, the storytelling. And so I think there is a way of leaning into to both sides where, where, where it's, yes, this is the professional side of the business. Let's talk about this because it's all that we've already laid all of our cards out on the deck, but also what's real. Because in every single story, there is a, every single good story, there is a layer of truth and many layers of tr- truth quite often. And, and so how do we bring them in with the layers of truth that are unkind, that are unforgiving, and 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 we... We harness them so that people get more invested in the story because there is always an element of, of truth and conflict because it is, it is a competitive business. We're not all holding hands backstage going kumbaya. And if we are, we're not being honest with each other because I want to I be the top dog and whoever else is on top wants to be the top dog. And sometimes, sometimes you, you're going to butt heads. And yes, there are room for multiple people at the top, but you always want to be the best. You always want to be the best. And so, and so you're always trying to find a way to get the better of somebody else. Always, always. That's just the nature of the business. And we have to accept that and move on. Um, and, and it's a way that you do it, that you can get people involved. You can get people invested and you can bring everybody else up, you know, because if, 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 if I'm talking about, how much I dislike Trish Stratus, but she's saying how great I, that's not interesting. That's, that's not interesting. We want the conflict. Yeah. Tell me how much you hate me because I hate you. I was never a fan of Trish Stratus, for example, you know? And so, and so being opposite her um, and, and bringing those truths out, I think, I think help everything because, because we're doing both. We are doing both. It is, it is both a competition and it's also a symbiotic thing where we're all working together so it's it's interesting. It's a business like it's a business like no other, really. Yeah, that's a really interesting answer. Uh, do you have people um, outside of the WWE who help you with either your social media or what you would sort of consider external PR? Um, no, no. Currently, I do not know. I've had I've had well, you know, I'll, I'll consult with some friends outside here and there, um, here and there now, but. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, yeah I, I suppose, because you always consult with your friends, you know, you, you give them an idea and, and uh, or they give you an idea and you bring that in and you see if it works and you test it out. And um, and, and then uh, I'll, I'll have a friend that I text sometimes if I'm if I'm about to tweet something or or say something um, that I, I, I need a 
I need a proofread on or, or, uh, will this get me fired? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, is this too harsh? Um, kind of a thing. So, so yeah, yeah, I think, I think, I think, um, I have a few people, not, I suppose, in the professional sense. I don't have anybody employed that I would, uh, go to, but, but I have people that I consult with. Gotcha. Okay. So some sounding boards. I want to ask you yep. just a couple of quick questions yep. about social media. Um, as I said at the top, it, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to put you over here. I, like, I really believe this. Like you're the, you're the, as someone who um, is fascinated by the business and has watched and read for a long time, I, I consider you the singular best person who's ever used social media who works in pro wrestling. For example, I'll just let my audience know this. Becky Lynch's first tweet on threads. I, I think I'm still laughing at this. Her first tweet was, I have joined your shitty cult, which is absolutely fantastically brilliant because it works on so many different levels. It's not just uh, uh, like uh, a professional wrestling tweet. It really works in terms of just threads, the obsession with it, particularly when people were moving from Twitter. And so uh, I wanted to ask you, Becky, like, do you, I don't, how do I even ask this? Like, do you put yourself in character? As you are tweeting, do you do you almost have to do that so you're tweeting as Becky Lynch and not Rebecca? Yeah, some sometimes, uh, sometimes yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think there is a, I don't, I don't know where Rebecca Quinn starts and Becky Lynch ends, you know, um, and 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 especially I suppose in, in terms of putting myself out there on social media, um, I have a very weird relationship with social media actually, um, and I think. I think a lot of it started with uh, around, around the pandemic. I think a lot of us started to get this weird relationship with social media. It is a great, it's a great promotional tool. Um, and I think as well, when I had a child, though, th there's less time that you, that, that something has to give, right? When you're, when you are a full-time parent and you're a full-time performer, WWE, and you have media obligations and you're writing a book and you've just finished a second book <laughs> um because what else would you be doing with your time um and 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 sometimes i i worry about the effects that social media has on the world and our connection with each other and of course it has this great it's this great tool to use in promotion and putting ourselves out there i think twitter became a bit of a cesspool you know um not it, you know it's it started and um especially around 2020 just rapidly got got pretty awful but again it is a way to communicate with the fans but it's also hard to to navigate that i think for anybody for anybody it it's it's hard to navigate between the comments how do we how do we how do we garner this connection with people with but the other thing is 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 that I think it gave, I think it gives all of us a skewed perception of humankind because everybody's, everybody's reduced to avatars on there, which is great in wrestling. It's great in wrestling. It's great in wrestling. It's great when I'm talking about Trish Stratus, Zoe Stark, whoever else. Um, I think when it comes to humanity and, 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 and people being reduced to avatars and, and and talking in 140 characters at each other where where opinions are seen as absolute and you you just you just see the disintegration of of just relationships constantly constantly and just arguments and things and so i think it's a weird thing to kind of look at realize that it can be helpful for one part but also know that it's probably very harmful for 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 personal life and, and and looking at the world i think that's that's when i started to kind of go okay what 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 is this what is this like like yes we need it we need it we need it we need it to a certain level we we need it to a certain level of promotion and then when are you getting sucked in as a person to the algorithm and things that you that again it comes back to protecting your mind and and how do you be the artist that you want to be without being sucked into an algorithm and being fed things that you don't necessarily want to see am i making sense 
<laughs> you do, yeah, I, 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 I'm 100%. So I have one follow up on this because I, I think it, I think you can provide insight that I that I couldn't. So I, I just went on your Twitter feed. You have 2.3 million followers. Uh, you know what? How many are bots or not? It doesn't really matter. You're still dealing with a crazy level. Um, I, I'm I don't have near those kind of followers, but I have like 100 and around 190,000 or so. So I, you know, it, it, it will filter into me. There are times when I find it impossible to navigate that particular site because like you said, it gets in my head, but I am not like, I'm not an artist. Um, Lord knows anybody reading me would say that. So in that <laughs> sense, like, like, how do I sort of say this in some ways, Becky, when you put something out, like the artist wants to see how this performance has played. So on the one hand, if you if you send something out on your social media feeds, as the artist, you kind of want to see if it's working or not. But then it gets into what you just said. If you spend too much time in that pool, you can mentally drown. So I don't know. Do you just sort of do what you feel like may work and then just get out of there? Or do you have to see people reacting to something you do. I wish I asked that question better, but I think you know what I'm getting. Well, I, I think I know exactly what you want. You're, you're asking. So actually I have a guy on the WWE social media team, uh, Sant legend. I will, uh, I, he has my Twitter information. I will say, say this <laughs> and he will put that out. And then I'll say, what is the response? And he'll say, good. Uh, people aren't really buying it. And, and so that way I, it's, it's, it's my words but I'm protected from it, if that makes sense. So I don't, I don't have Twitter on my phone. I don't have it on my phone. I don't have it. Um, and so, uh, and, and so I'm able to, to put stuff out into the world and then, um, and, and, and see whether things are positive or negative without getting sucked into individual opinions and things that may, uh, affect my performance, because I think that is the, that's 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 prize space right there and i think at a certain level like when i was coming up when i had when i was rising things were different um and 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 you really had to be on the ball constantly um looking at things seeing what was working what was what wasn't and and in a way you were kind of fighting to get your spot and and now that i kind of have my spot i want to um be able to take from there and 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 go upwards but it came to a spot where i realized like ah i don't think this is helping anymore in fact i think this is hurting so you have to be able to navigate and be honest with yourself with what works and what doesn't and what feels right and what doesn't and what's giving you more anxiety or what's making things more fun what is making it more fun because then you will do more of that and 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 if you're having fun everybody else is having fun i i truly believe that as a performer and so um finding finding that balance of things i think is 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 important all right uh i'm gonna get you out of here becky in uh under 10 minutes there's a couple left here that i want to get to the one thing we still see way too infrequently in my opinion are women broadcasters either doing play-by-play -play or in the analyst chair for wrestling companies you've had a little bit of experience with this when you'll pop onto the mic um if you ever decided to do this full time, I think you'd be incredible as an analyst. D does that interest you at all whenever you decide that you want to transition from a in-ring performer to, to something out of ring? God, honestly, I don't think I've ever even considered it because I just look at like Kevin Patrick and Corey Graves and Michael Cole and Wade Barrett, and they're all incredible. But I just go, how do you hold your pee for that long? You know? <laughs> And I go, I think I'll be starving, you know, like I'm a snacker. I just need need my snacks and to keep that energy up for that length of time and not have to pee. I, I don't know. I, th I think that's the reason that I've never. So it's never even been a consideration. Not to say, but but now that we're talking about it. I, th I think I would be fairly good at it. I do like to talk and I like to watch wrestling and I like to analyze wrestling and give my two cents. So, um, I mean, it is something I think, but again, it comes to this, like when you think about it, raw is, is over three hours. They got to hold their pee for that long. 
I should, yeah, Michael Cole, Michael Cole's been on this pot. Michael Cole's been on this podcast. I should have asked him actually. Maybe he doesn't hold this pee. There's your story. No, no, no. They uh, do. They do. I, I, yeah. I've, no, I've I know. Asked them this question. <laughs> this question. Um, you mentioned you're writing a book, so you have an autobiography coming out in 2024. Um, people who I've interviewed, um, just in the traditional media space when they've written or even if they've um, like been interviewed by someone who's writing the book, it's very, very cathartic for them. So if I don't know where you are in the process, but have you found that, have you found the process of talking about your life cathartic, interesting, nerve wracking, all of the above? I think all of the above. I think it forces you to look at the areas um, because right, we all think of ourselves as the hero of our own story. And at some point you, you look at yourself and you go, Oh no, I was the asshole. I was the asshole. <laughs> you know, so, so, so things like that, um, where you have to be really honest with yourself, uh, is, is quite humbling. But I, I, I did love the writing process, especially the early writing process, where it was just a brain dump, just a pure, let me get all of my thoughts, all of my ideas, all of my memories just down on paper. Let me just, let me just write with without the the moral police being on my shoulder without um without the 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 public uh, uh judgment on, on my shoulder let me just write let me just write for me and i found that experience to be my favorite part when it came to the editing process and going back and looking at everything and then i did a i did a year long writing course because uh Wow. So you I, wrote it yourself. I, I did write it myself. Yeah. And I wrote awesome. it and then realized that I didn't know anything about writing. But um, it's one of those things. Have you heard of the, the Kruger effect where where you start something, right? And you, you've never done it. And you're like, I am awesome at this. I am so good. I'm the best. I'm a prodigy. I'm a natural. And that's how I felt about writing. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I did this writing course because I wanted to be good at it. And then, uh, and then I, I found out how little I knew about writing and it's very intimidating. And it was like a, a, a round circle program where you other people, um, reading your work and, and giving feedback and it was very helpful. Um, and, and so you find out what's working and what, what isn't working, but you also find out how much you don't know and you're learning. But I, I love that process too, because I love, um, I love trying to improve on something, especially when I get passionate about something and I want to be good at it. And I really, I really love writing. It's something that I've done my whole life. My dad had me writing journals since as long as I could write. And I've always found that to be the, the almost meditative for me. And so, so writing, writing, writing the book was, uh, was a great process. Like I said, now I'm in the editing process, the late editing process. I had some some problems with editors, some people leaving the company and and finding. But now I've I've got a great editor, so so we're off to the races. Hopefully, it'll be out early next year. The reason I laughed is you know I've been in journalism for a long time, so having problems with editors is like join the club. Oh. On, that's just a con. <laughs> see see what I'm saying? Because there's I, I I I don't know what I don't know, so I didn't know that that. Uh, having problems with editors is a is a problem. So there we go. But a great editor is invaluable and will save your bacon. So like that is it's a valuable thing. And then for people who just want to Google it, uh, it's the Dunning Kruger effect. Uh, my 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 late mom was a shrink, so I I, I remember seeing Dunning Kruger uh, <laughs> like notes somewhere. Maybe she was working on me. Who knows? Um, <laughs> last one for me. Uh, you know, you have this ability, uh, which. Um, is, is something that translates uh, beyond pro wrestling, and that's to be able to connect with an audience. So uh, we'll, we'll leave some self, this will be the last one and be maybe some self-help for people who are listening. So let's say I'm a, whatever, teacher, salesman, uh, saleswoman, accountant, whatever. Um, is there anything that you've learned from performing in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people on connecting with an audience that others could just learn from from you, from whatever you you've learned about human interaction or whatever that is, like what's your advice for how someone can connect with an audience, whether it's eighty thousand at a stadium or whether it's the person in front of you? Um, so I've never been natural at anything in my life, not anything except connecting with an audience. I think, I, and 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 the reason 
that I think I've been able to connect with them because it's not ever so it's not ever something that I necessarily sought out to try to do but it's an energy that you bring that I think brings people in and I think when I go out there I'm excited and I, I'm very excited to perform for these people and I think they can sense a genuine love from from me to them and uh, and, and from me to to the art and to the performance that I think brings people in and I think there is a there's a, maybe a bit of a vulnerability um that I that I bring to you know I I think um I think I'm I'm not afraid to make a fool out of myself as evidence by my NXT de- debut um and for anybody who hasn't seen that top top 5 worst WWE or any wrestling debuts of all time. Um, but I think I think it's that uh ability to go out there and, and maybe not be self-conscious because I think you cannot constant you cannot be conscious of yourself and also let people in. You have to be conscious of everybody else, you know? So I think it's putting your energy and your focus on everybody else, taking it away from yourself. And once you do that, then you allow the energy to come back at you if that makes any sense but i think more than anything it's 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 just an energy it's it's all that is it's a it sounds very hippy dippy um but it's just an energy of being able to communicate with people and and getting yourself out of the way so that you're not you're not looking at yourself doing all of this you have to just be in it and be in the moment and be with the people feel the people feel their energy and give that love and that passion of whatever it is that you want to bring out that intensity. But, but you have to focus on that, on, on the art form and, and, um, and what you're out there to do as opposed to looking inward at yourself and how am I doing? Am I doing okay? Is this, is this okay? Am I supposed to be standing like this? Am I supposed to be doing this with my hands? Am I supposed to be saying this with my words? You know, I think you have to get rid of all of that. And once you do that, you you free yourself up for um for for a connection. I, I think that I think that's just human nature, really. You know, you can tell when you're talking to somebody whether they're they're focused on you or they're focused on themselves and what's going on, or they're giving you an energy. And I think it's very much the same as having a conversation. It's just with a with a wider with a wider audience. I think it's all that, like the attention that you can give. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, I like yeah. that answer a lot. I hope uh, I hope you you'll come back on in 2024 when your book is out. Uh, I, would I would love to, to uh, would love extend that. Um, all right, you just heard for 30 plus minutes, Becky Lynch. Um, I have said this on this podcast many times. I think I even told Paul Heyman when he was on. This was the person who I most wanted to talk to in the pro wrestling universe, and uh, absolutely lived up to my expectations. You could obviously see her on WWE programming. She's in the middle of. Uh, She's in the middle of battling that uh, Canadian Trish Stratus. We'll see how that uh, works out. And then again, obviously, SummerSlam is this Saturday, 8 p.m. Uh, Peacock in the U.S., the WWE Network, everywhere else. Uh, Becky, this was really great. Um, thank you. I wish you honestly nothing but uh, the best of success. And uh, and I'll absolutely uh, I'll absolutely continue to follow. Thank you uh, so much for joining me today on the Sports Media Podcast. Thanks for having me on. All right, back in the studio. My thanks to uh, Becky Lynch. Uh, like I said, I've been wanting to do that for uh, quite some time, and um, I, you know, I think she's just she's just a brilliant performer, brilliant sports entertainment performer, and there's a reason why she's um, she's achieved what she's achieved. Writing a book in 2024 has a uh, uh, a new baby, and maybe it's a year plus now, but uh, uh, juggling just sort of a lot and. Uh, and at the, at the top of uh, the top of her profession. Uh, if you like these kind of conversations, head to the archives. Andrea Carter of uh, ESPN, a uh, rising basketball analyst, was my uh, last guest. We did uh, can Messi make a difference and and his impact on the Apple MLS partnership with Alex Silverman of the Sports Business Journal and Paul Tenorio of the uh, Athletic. Analyst Michael Nathanson came on to talk about how Disney will handle 
ESPN heading forward. Had the student journalist at the Daily Northwestern who reported on Pat Fitzgerald, the now former Northwestern coach, and Neil Everett on July 12th talking about uh, his uh, his long ESPN run. If you like these conversations, please leave us a five-star review and a nice note. That is how this podcast continues. I want to thank Patrick Antonetti for all his hard work. Thank you to everybody at Odyssey. And most of all, thank you for listening. We'll see you soon on the Sports Media Podcast.